Start with blood. So we're going to do a blood lab today. Some people are walking around from the first lab with at least one bandage on their finger. Uh, and then uh, we'll start doing the anatomy of the heart tomorrow, the physiology of the heart on Thursday. And then relating the physiology of the heart to the blood pressures uh, on next Tuesday and then test again. So. Uh, when we look at the blood, the one thing we talked about last time in relationship to acidosis and, and alkalosis is the fact that we really don't like a very big shift in blood pH. So we consider the normal blood pH to be 7.45 to 7.35. And if you're, if you're beyond 7.35, 7.2, then you're in a state of acidosis. And if you're beyond 7.45, like 7.5, then you'd be in a state of alkalosis, right? And then the two systems that we'd be trying to resolve that would be the respiratory, the respiratory system and the kidney, all right? So not surprisingly, we're going to be re reviewing some things from both those systems. Because the role of the cardiovascular system is to pump blood through the lungs, to collect blood from the lungs, and pump it to the body. So it's actually the cardiovascular system that takes the end product of external respiration and creates the blood flow that allows us to do internal respiration. So it's a connection between there. And then obviously the heart pumps blood through the kidney so we can do filtration as well. So when we look at the major functions of blood uh, it includes transport of oxygen, largely attached to what molecule? Hemoglobin. Uh, the transport of carbon dioxide, where the bulk of the carbon dioxide is not attached to hemoglobin, but carried as what ion? A bicarbonate ion. And then all of the nutrients that we absorb from the digestive system in unit one all go to the liver first via the hepatic portal vein. And then after the liver has processed it, the blood is dumped into the inferior vena cava and the next place it goes is to the heart. So then the heart is responsible for transporting those nutrients body-wide for you to use. Uh, any intricate organ, and the ones we talked about last unit were like the thyroid, parathyroid, and the adrenal glands secrete products to the blood, which are hormones. And then the blood's role is to transport those hormones to where the hormones are going to be active or target tissue. All right. And then we talked about heat last time and its effect on your ability to oxygenate your hemoglobin. So in our tissues, we add heat to our blood. In our lungs, we dissipate that heat and cooler blood, and then metabolic waste as well. So we use the fact that the blood is circulating through the lungs and kidneys to help us regulate the pH of our blood, to help regulate body temperature, and to regulate the water content of the blood. So in terms of the cardiovascular system role, it's creating the blood flow that allows those other systems to do their job that we've already talked about, right? And then, uh, because it's so critical that we maintain approximately six liters of blood, then we have a whole mechanism that prevents us from bleeding to death quickly. So we have a clotting process that allows us to, to uh, avoid uh, extreme blood loss. And then the other thing we're going to begin to talk about this time is the type of blood cells we have in our blood. We can divide those cells into two groups, red blood cells and white blood cells. And then what we're going to do is divide white blood cells into types of white blood cells. And white blood cells are critical for our protection against diseases and they're phagocytic and, and produce antibodies in an immune system response um, to invading particles. So one of the things that becomes important is that we have six liters of blood, but the amount of liquid in the blood relative to the amount of cells in the blood becomes really critical. 
So as the amount of liquid drops in the blood and the amount of cells in the blood would increase, our blood would become more viscous or thicker, which creates problems with pumping. So what we try to do is maintain a relationship between the fluid in the blood and the number of cells in the blood. So from a clinical standpoint, what we do to ascertain someone's state of hopefully homeostasis is that we do what we call a hematocrit test. In a hematocrit test, what we do is we take a tube that we put blood in and we spin it in a centrifuge. The way centrifuges work is the heavier the, the item, the further it gets drawn down into the tube, the lighter the item, the higher up it sells in the tube. So what we can do with a centrifuge is we can separate the blood into the blood plasma, which will be a straw-colored liquid, and the form elements, uh, which will be the blood cells. So in essence, in a hematocrit, what we're doing is we're dividing the blood into two fractions, formed elements and blood plasma at the top. And then the values are slightly different for males and females during, uh, during females' reproductive years because of ovarian cycles, there's a loss of blood on a monthly basis. So in a clinical standpoint, when you're looking at hematocrits for women in, that haven't gone through menopause, then, they're used, then they have a normal, slightly lower value than men. So for a normal hematocrit for women, it would be as low as 38 to as high as 46. Postmenopausally, because women start stop having ovarian cycles, therefore stop losing blood on a monthly basis. And in younger women who may have had hysterectomies, the same thing would be true of. Uh, then their values are slightly lower. Post hysterectomy or post uh, menopause, women's values equal men's values. And so it'd be 40 is a low to 54 is a high. So you can see the men's values are slightly more shifted than women's values during those reproductive years. All right. And then the other thing we're going to do as we talk about it is we're going to take the form of elements and separate them into their constituent parts. So the most common cell in your blood is a red blood cell. And we, on average, have between 4.8 and 5.4 million red blood cells per microliter of blood. So we have a tremendous load of, of red blood cells in our, in our blood. And the way we'll look at that is, is we will look at anemia as a way to measure that particular value. Red blood cells are not nucleated as adult cells, so they're not living cells. They circulate for about 120 days before they are broken down and replaced. Uh, and so you're replacing red blood cells at about uh, 2 million per second uh, in normal physiology. White blood cells, although critically important to fight infections, are much less common. So we'd have about 5,000 to 10,000 in normal physiology per microliter of blood. And white blood cells only last about 14 days. So our turnover rate in white blood cells is much more rapid than red blood cells. And if you have an infection, many times white blood cells are destroyed in their fight against the infection. So what we can use is a differential white count to look at shifts in what's going on in white blood cells as a diagnostic tool to try to figure out what's going on with a patient. Because if you're losing a lot of white blood cells and fighting an infection, your body will shift to make a bunch of new white blood cells. And we can, we can follow that, that path. And then we have about 150 to 400,000 platelets per microliter of blood. Platelets form as a cell in your bone marrow, and then the cells fragment into tiny parts. So platelets represent fragmented cells. And again, platelets are turned over fairly quickly. Uh, and they're involved in the clotting process. So what we're going to do with white blood cells is we're going to eventually divide them into their constituent types of cells. The most common white blood cell that we're going to talk about is a neutrophil. So if you counted 100 white blood cells, which is actually what they used to do clinically, if you were a, a laboratory tech, you would get a blood slide from someone 
you would set it in a microscope and you would count 100 white blood cells. And you'd do it in a way where you had a search pattern mm -hmm. on the slide that doesn't allow you to recount your cells. And then you would actually sit there and keep track of how many different cells you actually did. So in the United States, we have a machine that does that now. We just stick it in the machine and it does it. But if you went into the Peace Corps and you went into rural Africa or rural Central America where healthcare and the laboratories that we take for granted aren't available, you would be sitting there with a microscope and a slide doing a white cell count. Maybe. All right. So neutrophils are our most common white blood cell followed by lymphocytes, about 20 to 25 percent. And then after that, the, the, the population drops appreciably. Monocytes, 3 to 8 percent normal physiology. Eosinophils, 2 to 4 percent. And then basophils, 0.5 to 1 percent. Now you can't have half a cell. So 0.5 is telling you one per 200 white blood cells that you counted. Right? So, and then what we can do is if we know the normal values, then if we see shifts where maybe you're seeing 10 basophils instead of one, then we know that for some reason the body is increasing its basophil uh, production. And then we can tie with that why basophils actually occur, what their normal function is in the blood. And then we can draw some conclusions about what's going on with the body. So white blood cell counts really kind of help us determine what's going on. So a classic example would be you could have a patient come in with lower right quadrant pain, and that lower right, right quadrant pain would suggest appendicitis. But you're not going to do surgery on someone just because they have lower right quadrant pain. The first thing you'll do is a blood test, and you'll do a differential white count. And if the white count comes back elevated, now you have the second thing that's out of here that they most likely have appendicitis. If the white cell, cell count doesn't come back uh, positive, elevated, then you, you don't have an answer yet to, to what you think might be going on. So that's why we use it. And then what will, stay in the, what will stay in the blood plasma are proteins which make up DCOP, that osmotic value that we talked about, albumin being the most critical one. Uh, and, then, uh, and then some electrolytes and uh, regulatory substances that would be in the plasma as well. So one of the things that we do have a matter for is because there are reasons why the body would shift in its blood cell production. So they can range from leukemias, where you've got a cancer of, of bone marrow that's causing rapid uh, production of cells, to uh, things that just shift red blood cells. So we're going to start with that point and then come back to leukemias after we've talked about white blood cells. So if you have a shift in red blood cell formation, then we say the patient has polycythemia. All right. So anytime you hear the word polycythemia, that means that somebody's hematocrit value was uh, abnormal. And the reason why their hematocrit value was abnormal was that they have many more red blood cells than a normal person. Now, one of the things that drives red blood cell formation is hypoxic tissues. So tissues that are storing for oxygen, and particularly the kidney itself, as the kidney cells begin to starve for oxygen, they, they release a hormone that we talked about, erythropoietin, that drives blood cell formation. And we're going to review that in a minute. So there are a couple of reasons why we can see it clinically. The most common would be what we would call physiologic polycythemia. And it's due to hypoxic tissues. So it could be that the person is an extreme athlete. They're, they're a, a iron, iron man athlete, and they're in the intensive training that would drive their red blood cells up a little bit. Or it could be because they've been training and or exercising at elevations. So as, as you go up in elevation, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere drops. So the amount of hemoglobin to attach oxygen to becomes critical. So if we went to the, one of the highest towns in, in continental United States is Leadville, Colorado at 14,000 feet. And you were working in a clinic in Leadville, Colorado doing blood analysis. And then you got a new job in Seattle. And you went to Seattle, 
you would think everybody was anemic as hell in Seattle because their red blood cell production would be much lower than those people in, in red blood. So that's physiologic polycythemia. That's the reason why when people do Everest, they go to base camp at 19,000 feet and stay two weeks there to let the body begin to acclimate, to let that hypoxia drive blood cell formation so that you increase your red blood cell formation and then you can oxygenate yourself better. So then the other one besides hypoxic tissues uh, would be polycythemia vera, which is actually a gene mutation in, in the line of cells that produce red blood cells, uh, which are called hemocyloblastic. So remember, blast meaning the stem cell. Yeah. And in people with polycythemia vera, their hematic rates can be as high as 70, where a normal woman's would be high would be 48 in, during the reproductive years, and men's 54. Now the dilemma we have is as the blood has more cells in it, the blood becomes more viscous or thicker. And the thicker the blood, the harder it is to pump through tissue, so it drives blood pressure up. And then at night, when you go to sleep, because the blood is harder to move through tissues, blood tends to pool in the venual side of the cardiovascular system. And as blood flow stops, inter intervascular clotting increases. So our biggest concern with, with polycythemia is an increase in, in clotting inside blood vessels. That creates some problems that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Okay. So just as a quick review then, what we have is we have the formed elements that make up the bottom part of the hematocrit. And then in the plasma, we carry all the electrolytes that are critically important to our body. So the other thing we can do with the blood analysis is look for electrolytes. And that's what the last lecture in the last unit was all about with the, with the uh, hyponeutremia, hypernutremia was recognizing that we carry critical electrolytes in our blood. So sodium is a very critical positive electrolyte in our blood, calcium, and then chloride and bicarbonate. Whereas potassium is very low in the blood, phosphate is very low in the blood. So, so we compartmentalize electrolytes in our extracellular component and our intracellular component. And that's part of what we went through uh, in the last year. So, for us to manage making a mil two million red blood cells a second, and for us to manage replacing our white blood cell population every 14 days, we have to, throughout our lives, have stem cells that allow us to make new blood cells. So now it's surprising when people have cancer and we put them on a chemotherapy agent most chemotherapy agents target and destroy actively mitotic tissue. So tumors are very highly mitotic tissues. They're giving rise to new cells all the time. So we try to use an agent that will target the tumor and prevent it from continuing to grow. But unfortunately, it targets all of our other cells. So the cells that we really see get hit are stem cells that are really active. So in men, uh, their sperm production will drop completely out while they're on chemotherapy because it targets the stem cells that allow us to make sperm. And then in, in all populations, the white blood cell and red blood cell counts will drop reversibly. So it's not uncommon for people who are on chemotherapy to become very anemic, oftentimes requiring blood transfusions to stay alive, to not be able to clot their blood so that they get a nosebleed and they can't stop the bleeding in their nose so they end up in an emergency room where they have to surgically stop the bleeding in their nose because they have no pl platelets left because those have been destroyed. And so you also have to do, trans uh, you also have to do transfusions to maintain platelet counts. And then they become very susceptible to all kinds of diseases that would not normally affect us like typically when people are on intensive chemotherapy, they cannot go to a restaurant and eat. That will kill them because of the bacteria that's on the forks and the plates at a restaurant. 
so they can no longer go out in a public area and eat. And they can't actually have their family members touch the plate or the silverware that they're going to eat with because their, their white blood cell count is so low. So the, the dilemma we have with chemotherapy is we haven't learned to target the chemotherapy agent to tumors. There's a bunch of cool research looking at, at cell identifying markers on tumors. And if we can work on that, then we can attach that marker to the chemotherapy agent. Then it will only bind to a tumor cell. And then we can, we can very much refine what we're doing and what we're living with in terms of managing those populations. So what we have in our body is, is with, in our bone marrow are what we call pluripotent stem cells. So there's a couple of words that we can use. So pluripotent versus unipotent stem cell. So most of the stem cells we've talked about to date, the satellite cells that were in our, in our muscles, those are unipotent stem cells. Those cells know how to become one cell, but not many cells. So the problem with using adult stem cells in research is that they're limited in what they can do. So the stem cells in bone marrow are much better cells for research because they're pluripotent. They can become a number of different things. So the thing to remember is that when just as a quick overview, is that we start with a cell, and that cell has 46 individual sets of chromosomes. And then on the chromosomes, we contain sequences of DNA that we call genes, right? So the, the key to a stem cell is it has the genes to make any cell in your body. So it can make an eye cell, it can make a hair. It has those genes. And through this process of differentiation, as we go from a pluripotent stem cell toward a unipotent stem cell, then genes are turned off. So we actually we have genes that get turned off. And then the cell can no longer read those genes and can no longer use them to become any particular thing. So the key to stem cell research is learning and understanding those gene expression agents, what causes a gene to be expressed. And going back and being able to turn on a gene in a cell whose who cell has been turned off. All right. So when we look at what goes on, we use hormones largely to drive gene expression. So in our body, what drives gene expression is largely hormones or, or chemical communicators. And what we have to do is supply a critical chemical communicator that drives what the cell is going to do, right? So the formation of, of blood cells is really cool because it's a, it's, it's a cool way to look at this whole process. So we're going to start with the unipotent stem cell. And we're not going to get into detail. If you, if you need the detail, you'll take a, a hematology class that will go into extreme detail. So we're just going to learn a few of the more common hormones and the process without the detail for our purposes. So we start with a pluripotent stem cell. If we have a chemotherapy agent that has killed somebody's pluripotent stem cells, they will never be able to produce red blood cells or white blood cells again. So what we have to do is a bone marrow transplant. And what are we wanting out of that bone marrow transplant? Pluripotent stem cells. That's what we're wanting from the donor, is the stem cells that allow us to begin to make these these cells again, all right? So if we expose a pluripotent stem cell to two different hormones, one will make the pluripotent stem cell convert to a myelial stem cell. The other hormone will convert the pluripotent stem cell to a lymphoid stem cell. So what we've done is we've turned genes on and off in this cell, and we've committed the cell to what it can do. So if we convert a pluripotent stem cell to a, a lymphoid stem cell, it can only become uh, lymphocytes. That's the only thing that that cell will become. So we took a cell that could become many different cells, and we turned a bunch of genes off and made it only become one cell group. Does that make sense? So if we convert the pluripotent stem cell to a myeloid stem cell, then we still have a number of cells that that's, that that can shift into. 
histamines. So it's just a stepwise process of using chemicals to control gene expression to drive what a cell can actually develop into. So what happens then is our most common form, our most common use of pluripotent stem cells is to form red blood cells, which is why one of the classic outcomes of most chemotherapy is the big patient becomes really anemic because they stop producing red blood cells. So what we need is we need something that's going to convert the pluripotent stem cell to a myeloid stem cell. Then we need a, a gene expression agent called CFUE. So CFU is colony factor. Um, and then if we expose a myeloid stem cell to CFUE, it becomes a pro-urethroblast. Then if we expose pro-urethroblast to urethropoietin, then we'll drive the formation of red blood cells. So that's why athletes use urethropoietin to increase their red blood cell count. And that's what we check when athletes are doping for the end products of the metabolization of urethropoietin. Yeah. What does the U and the E stand for? It's colony factor unit, and then E is for uh, urethroblast. So anything that's going to become a red blood cell is a urethroblast. Okay. All right. So what happens then is we can drive the formation of red blood cells in our bone marrow with this hormone called urethropoietin. And so that's this hormone right here. And then what happens is it causes all these cells to make a bunch of hemoglobin. Because we need the genes in the DNA to make hemoglobin. The dilemma we have is the nucleus takes up a good volume of a cell. Red blood cells have to be small enough to get through capillary beds and loaded with enough hemoglobin to be effective at carrying oxygen. So what we do is that the cell uh, converts to what we call a reticulocyte and then it ejects its nucleus. So that we end up with a, a, a a mature red blood cell that is a bag of hemoglobin without a nucleus. So without a nucleus, the cell cannot drive any of its biochemistry anymore. So that's why the cells only live for 120 days, and then they have to be broken down and, and recycled. So what's amazing is, uh, is that to move from water to a terrestrial environment requires elaborate patterns of carrying oxygen. So critters that live in water don't have to get rid of the nucleus in their red blood cells. Critters that live in terrestrial environments do. So fish do not have, the fish have nucleated red blood cells. Salamanders, frogs, all have nucleated red blood cells. As soon as we get a skin that's impermeable to water, amphibians, birds, and mammals, then we have no longer have nucleated red blood cells right here. It's a real cool pattern. It's a pretty cool pattern that, that actually exists. So we're doing this at about 20 million cells per second. It's going to warm in there. All right. So what we need is we need some white blood cells and platelets. So what we have to do is take the same stem cell, the myeloid stem cell, then we have to give it a different chemical communication that will convert it so CFU again is colony factor unit, and then mega for mega karyoblast. So we can convert a myeloid stem cell to a mega karyoblast if we use CFU meg, right? And then what happens is mega karyoblasts make a bunch of things internally and become mega karyocytes. And then right before the mega karyocyte is going to be released to the blood, it fragments into a bunch of cell fragments, which are what we call platelets. Okay? So platelets are actually fragments of cells that, that occur during this process. So notice the pattern is that these cells are all named blasts because they are immature cells. And all the cells down here that are the that are labeled as cells in the word site because they're mature cells. All right. So if we want to 
to make neutrophils or monocytes, then what we have to do is expose a myeloid stem cell to CFUGM, and then it'll convert the myeloid stem cell either into a monoblast or a myeloblast. Then other communicators cause a monoblast to become a mature monocyte, which is circulated. And then if monocytes migrate out of the cardiovascular system into tissues, then we refer to them as macrophages. Okay. So a macrophage is a monocyte outside of the cardiovascular system. All right. So uh, if we want to convert this myeloid stem cell to a myeloblast, then we have to use another communicator to convert it to a neutrophil. And this would be our most common type of white blood cell. And then neutrophils are kind of cool in that when they're first formed, like this one, the nucleus is kind of a band. So we call them band cells. And then clinically, if we see a bunch of band cells, then we know that for some reason the person is making a bunch of new neutrophils at a rapid rate. And then what happens is the nucleus begins to degenerate into lobes. So most commonly three lobe nucleus. And as they age, it'll increase the number of lobes to four lobe nucleus. And then the oldest neutrophils usually have a five lobe nucleus. So not only can we identify a neutrophil based upon the shape of the nucleus and having many lobes, but we can tell whether you're producing an increased number of them uh, because of the increase in band cells that actually exist. Now, when we look at white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils all belong to the same group of uh, white blood cells. They're called granular uh, white blood cells, which is what the G was for up here. Uh, but to create a eosinophil, you need a different cell communicator that converts a myeloid stem cell to an eosinophilic myeloblast. And then you need a different one for a basophil. And once we get a myeloblast, a basophilic myeloblast, and they become basophils, and eosinophilic myeloblasts become eosinophils. Now, what happens is neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils are all dealing with pH. So nutrient tells us it's, it's unaffected by pH. Eosin is the Latin word for acid and base is obviously base. So this whole nomenclature came from using staining techniques to distinguish white blood cells. So what happens is when you stain white blood cells, a neutrophil doesn't take up the stain. So it doesn't take up the city or basic stains. An eosinophil takes a an acidic stain. And the acidic stain is red. So what happens is the granules in an eosinophil become stained red. And that's how that's what allows us to distinguish an eosinophil. A basic stain, a basophil takes up the basic stain. And the basic stain is dark blue. So what, what happens then is basophil granules become purple or dark blue stain. So by using what's called, we're going to do it in lab today, by using what's called a right stain, we can expose white blood cells to either an acidic stain or a basic stain, and then that will help us separate a neutrophil from an eosinophil from a basophil. Because both eosinophils and basophils have uh, have nuclei that can look like a band or a two-lobe nucleus, as indicated here. 
So you got overlap in the way the nuclei look. So we use the stain to separate them. All right. Then what we're going to see is eosinophils and basophils are not very common at all in, in the body. And then if we convert a pluripotent stem cell to a myeloid stem cell, then we have to use a different communicator that converts it to a pre-B cell or a pro-thrombocyte. And then uh, thromboblasts actually will become what we call T lymphocytes. And pre-B cells become what we call B lymphocytes. And the thing about both lymphocytes is they have very large round nuclei. So T lymphocytes are referred to as small lymphocytes because you don't see very much cytoplasm at all around the nucleus. Whereas B lymphocytes are referred to as large lymphocytes because there's a lot of cytoplasm that can be seen around the nucleus. But their nucleus is very round and in shape. Usually B lymphocytes have a little divot in the nucleus right here that they're showing you a little help here. And then if B lymphocytes migrate out of the cardiovascular system, they become plasma cells in connective tissue. And then T lymphocytes can convert to, to T killer cells and a couple of other cells. So these, these cells have some conversions. So it's, it's the lymphocytes that uh, are the ones that reject tissues, so in transplants. And so what we have to use is we have to use drugs that prevent pluripotent stem cells from converting to uh, to these pro thrombocytes, and then we can shut shut off the formation of T lymphocytes. And as long as we shut down the formation of T lymphocytes, then a transplant patient will not reject their tissue. So they have to stay on that drug throughout their life, or they'll reject the tissue. Okay. Okay, cool. So if we look at the most common cell, which is the red blood cell. Uh, the reason why we have them is that they carry oxygen. So during their formation, they were round cells in the nucleus. When they eject their nucleus, the cell collapses where the nucleus was. So we end up with the cell instead of being perfectly round, which is biconvade. And so when you look at them, they're thicker toward the edge, thinner at the center. So when you look at them under this microscope, they look like donuts. But they're not actually a polyp. There's not a space in them. It's just that because they're bicuncated, they're, they're thinner at the center than the edge. And then what that does is greatly increase surface to volume ratio, which makes it an outstanding cell for diffusion. So we take this one and convert it to this. Now what we just got was a great increase in surface area. So if we increase surface area, we can increase the rate of Diffusion. So why is that critical? Because what do we want to diffuse into the cell? Oxygen. Oxygen. Yeah. So that's what we do. And by the way, these are platelets. These little tiny things uh, that we're seeing here on this slide. So I said I said two million. I guess it's actually three million per second. Uh, and they lack a nucleus. They're bicuncate, increase surface volume ratio, and they're reasonably small. So the, a capillary band the average diameter of the capillary band is 10 microns and the average diameter of a red blood cell is 8 microns so what happens in capillary bands is red blood cells have to go through in single form get through a capillary. So that's really cool. So remind me when we're doing circulation next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I think we have some goldfish down in the prep room. And what you can do is I can wrap a goldfish in a little wet cotton and they're they're like carp. They can go anoxic for a while without dying. And then we can take their tail and spread it on a glass slide, put it under a microscope, and you'll be able to see red blood cells going through the capillary bins in their tail in single file. Now, the reason why we can do that is because red blood cells, because fish red blood cells are nucleated, so they're bigger and they're easier to see under a microscope. And we'll be able to see them going through single file. And what's cool, the larger arteries in the tail, you'll see pulsing blood flow. But in capillary bins, it's, it's constant. 
So there's two things about blood that we're going to talk about that you'll be able to see, which is really cool, under a, uh, with a with a uh, with a goldfish tank. All right, so they pass through in single file. Now, the reason why we have red blood cells is because we want to load them with this compound, which is hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is made up of two, uh, two protein molecules, two alpha polypeptide chains, and two beta polypeptide chains. And then at the, at the center of each of these, and they're, they're, they're proteins that are rolled on themselves, globin, so they're globular proteins, which is where the end of the word globin comes from, the proteins. And then at the center of each protein, we have this, which is called a heme unit, so which is where the heme comes from, so hemoglobin, comes from the fact that we have these with these protein molecules. And at the center of each heme unit is an iron, and each heme unit can combine with one molecular oxygen. So the key to it is one alkene can combine with one O2. So each hemoglobin can carry four O2 molecules. Yeah. So what happens is we have to break these cells down because they can't maintain themselves because they have no nucleus. About every 120 days. <coughs> we can recycle all this material. We can recycle the iron out of this, but what we can't recycle are these uh, are these uh, cyclic hydrocarbon molecules. So this is what we convert to bilirubin, and the bilirubin we're putting in our bile are these cyclic compounds here. And then we get rid of those through our feces because we can't recycle them. So when you look at that process, it's really kind of cool. So connecting the first unit with this unit, then the liver is responsible for breaking down aging white blood cells. And we have phagocytic cells in the liver that do that, which were those tougher cells. And what they do is they take in and destroy aging red blood cells. They take the globins, the alpha and beta uh, protein molecules, break them down into amino acids, release the amino acids back to our blood, where they can be circulated back to our bone marrow to remake the protein. They take the heme, off of those cyclic compounds we just looked at. And since the iron won't be carried in the blood without a carrier, it attaches it to a protein called transferrin. And then that allows us then to carry the iron back to our bone marrow so we can recycle the iron. Then what we do is we take the cyclic compounds that we were just looking at, those, those cyclic hydrocarbons, and we convert those to Billy Burton, which is green, which is why they always show bile on all the models as being green, which eventually gets converted to bilirubin. We dump the bilirubin into our small intestine. The bilirubin goes into our large intestine where bacteria converted to urobilinogen. Urobilinogen is converted then by bacteria in a second step to this compound, which is brown, which explains why feces is usually brown. This is reabsorbable, gets back into our blood, where it's converted to this compound, which is yellow, which is why urine is yellow. So isn't that cool? The cyclic compounds explain the normal color of feces and the normal color of urine, which is why clinically you look at poop and you look at pee to see what color it is, so you have an idea of what the patient, what's going on with pee. Patient, isn't that cool? Then our goal is to be able to recycle this stuff so that we can recombine the iron uh, with the with the protein. Vitamin B12 is one of our key communicators for this process. So we have to have vitamin B12, and we have to have urethropoietin. If we have both vitamin B12 and urethropoietin, then we can produce red blood cells. Not a cruel process. So clinically, what we do is if somebody is deficient in hemoglobin, then we say they are anemic. So when we think about anemia, then we can have anemia for a couple of reasons. 
So if we get a decrease in circulating red blood cells, then we'd have less hemoglobin carry oxygen, and we would say we are anemic. We could have a normal number of red blood cells, but the red blood cells are low in hemoglobin. And if the red blood cells are low in hemoglobin, then we would still be anemic, right? So we have two ways in which this anemia can occur. We just don't produce enough red blood cells, or we produce the normal amount of red blood cells, but we lack the ability to produce hemoglobin. So either one of those is would make us anemic. So what we usually do in a clinical setting then is we measure the hemoglobin present in cells. So again, there's going to be a difference in reproductive age women versus men. And then again, postmenopausal women or post uh, hysterectomy women's values will equal men's values. Well, cholesterol is made, they're both managed by the liver, so. but they don't exactly go into the All right, so in men, we would say we're normal if we have 13 to 18 grams of hemoglobin per 100 ml of blood. And then in females, slightly lower, 12 to 16. And again, those are reproductive age women who are on, who have ovarian cycle. And we can actually manage that. Some women, young women have terrible periods. I mean, they have periods that last for two weeks, three weeks, and they lose a tremendous amount of blood, stay anemic. We can put them on birth control pills because we can manage the severity of their periods. So we can use hormones to actually manage that anemia in, in women. So, so there's kind of some interesting things. So if we look at anemia, the most common clinical reason for anemia you probably see is blood loss. Now it's obvious if some woman is coming in complaining that she's been on her period for three and a half weeks with heavy flow. It's less obvious when you get a geriatric man or a woman and you talk to them and there's no visible signs of blood loss. So the most common sign, reason for blood loss that's not visible is a GI bleed. So that they're actually losing blood through their feces, which is why we do uh, hemocult tests on feces to determine whether there's there's blood in it. A basic rule of thumb is the blacker the stool, the more blood in the stool. All things considered. So that's why you look at poo. Because <laughs> it tells you what's going on. So if you have a hemorrhage, it takes us two to three days to replace the fluid, but it takes much longer to replace the red blood cells. That's why you cannot give blood more frequently than once, say, every six weeks, right? But you can do blood plasma at a plasma center every four days. Because they are actually just removing the fluid, not the cells, where if you're giving whole blood, you're giving blood, you're losing blood. So, so again, the key to anemia is if you have a patient, they're anemic and you can't explain the anemia, then you have to start figuring out where this blood loss is occurring. So in kind of some chemotherapy agents, uh, change absorptive rates in the gut, they can really impact it. So that uh, sometimes on a chemotherapy, some people become so anemic because they're, they're totally low in iron, is that they have to use IV iron injections because you cannot put enough iron orally into them anymore because of the change in the gut lining that's occurring because of, because of the uh, chemotherapy agent. Uh, and then another reason would be uh, what we call microcytic, so micro small acidic cell, hypochromic, hypo, low, chrome color, anemia. And so this would be somebody and the test we're going to use in lab is one that helps you really distinguish between the hyperchromic anemia because you're looking at the color of the blood. Uh, and the less color there is in blood, then the more anemic the patient 
That's why if somebody's looking pale white, that might be a good sign they're anemic, because that's what gives most of us less, not dark complexion people our color. Right? So this could be due to low levels of uh, hemoglobin due to RBC chronic blood loss again and feces or due to low iron levels uh, because they're not absorbing iron well in their diet. And, uh, you can buy iron supplements and one of the things that iron supplements do is make somebody really constipated in terms of their stool really black. And that's because they're, not, they're just not absorbing the iron. So you know, you can go to the grocery store and you can buy iron supplements. But the problem we have in the United States is we don't have truth in advertising. And we don't have truth in labeling. And so you have to be a biochemist when you look at that iron supplement to know whether you can even absorb the iron. So you can actually go buy iron, cheap iron sources, and you can take them and it just ends up in your poop and you don't absorb any of it. Because we don't have truth in advertising and truth in labeling. And then I have to tell you that you're wasting your time taking your time and stuff in your hand. So that's kind of an interesting thing that happens. So, so aplastic anemia is due to a decrease in, in RBC production in bone marrow. Uh, the most common thing clinically you would see is people on chemotherapy are in aplastic anemia. That's why they're anemic. Uh, people have been exposed to uh, uh, radiation, uh, either through their work or, or through accidents, uh, will we'll enter aplastic anemia. So if you went to northern Japan right now and you start doing blood analysis, you would begin to see people that are living closest to those nuclear power plants would begin to be demonstrating aplastic anemia. Just like the people that were living closest to Chernobyl began to demonstrate aplastic anemia as well. So and they have certain other drugs, both drugs that uh, you can be prescribed and drugs you can buy on the street market will drive you to aplastic anemia. Uh, and then per pernicious anemia is an anemia caused by vitamin B12 deficiency. So one of the things you learn clinically is if you have anemia, you've ruled out uh, any blood loss in the stool because you did a hemocult that was normal, then now you've got to start thinking about why else someone would be anemic. And one good example could be that they're B12 deficient. So you could run a, a blood B12 test on them and see that they're actually low in B12. So then the easiest way to get B12 in someone would be oral B12. But the dilemma is chief cells in the stomach produce intrinsic factor, and you have to have intrinsic factor to absorb B12. So you could have a patient that you ruled out blood loss anemia. You now know they're B12 deficient. You put them on oral B12 for three months, come back, and their, their blood B12 didn't improve at all. Now you know the answer. They're not producing intrinsic factor, so it's a gastric problem and you will never be able to manage their B12 using oral B12. So then you have to use B12 shots to get it directly into them uh, so that you can get them out of this pernicious anemia. So just remember B12 is required for the blood cell formation. So you can have people that are B12 deficient. Uh, a couple of common causes, again, for B12 deficiency, certain drugs that people take. Uh, in fact, the, the ability to absorb B12, chronic alcoholics, uh, will begin to be B12 deficient. What, what do you need for iron absorption? Pardon? Iron absorption, what do you need for that? It's, it's how the iron is complex in the drug, in the, in the, in the supplement you're taking. If you're not deficient in B12 and you take, like, niacin, that way you get all flushed because it increases blood Yeah. But it's not really impacting the amount of people that you have a number of red blood cells. Oh, it's not. Yeah. Right, so there's a couple other anemias which are actually gene mutations that people would have. 
So they're, they're grouped together in what's called hemolytic anemias. So lytic meaning to lice or break. So in both these diseases, there's a gene mutation to the shape of the red blood cell. And it causes the red sub cell, blood cells to rupture in a higher, higher percentage. So the most common one you probably have heard of is sickle cell anemia, which is a gene mutation. So what happens is normally we, in our red blood cells, we re retain that five contained disc shape. It doesn't matter whether we have attached oxygen to our iron or not. The blood, the cell itself doesn't change its shape. So long story short, when you have a hemoglobin that can, can carry 402, the first hemoglobin is the hardest hemoglobin to put on. And the first hemoglobin changes the shape of the hemoglobin molecule. And so it makes it easier to put the other three on. So, so what happens in normal physiology is by adding 102 to the iron, we change the shape of the molecule. Normally, that doesn't affect the cell. And what's critical to that is the shape of the protein molecules, the two alpha and the two beta protein molecules, right? So in sickle cell anemia, we actually have a gene mutation that changes the shape of the beta molecules. So long story short, a protein molecule folds on itself because of critical amino acids it begins. What maintains the shape of this molecule are disulfide bridges. So it's very critical that we have amino acids that contain sulfur at critical points in the protein itself. So the common way you can see this is in hair. And whether you have straight hair, curly hair, or wavy hair is dependent upon which amino acids you have in your hair and the ability to disulfide bond. So the more amino acids with sulfur you have in your hair, the curlier your hair is going to be. So what we use at acid, when you go to the beauty shop, they put an acid on your hair, it breaks these disulfur bonds. Then you wrap your hair around something you want to retain its shape, then you neutralize the acid and the disulfur bonds reform. That's how perms work, is you're actually changing the pH of the hair changing the ability to create these disulfur bonds and then, and then changing the shape of the hair and then allowing the disulfur bonds to, to reconnect again. So it's kind of pretty, pretty cool, just a, a way to think about it. Well, what happened with sickle cell anemia is it's a point mutation. So a point mutation is a single codon. So remember, a codon is how many base pairs? Three base pairs. So like an A, T, C, or something like that. So what happened is a single mutation where the genetic information was changed changes this sulfur thing, and the, the molecule doesn't bend the same way. And so what happens is when, when oxygen binds with hemoglobin, it changes the shape of the hemoglobin molecule significantly, and the cells sickle out. They become really long, thin cells. Well, if a capillary bed is 10 microns, a round red blood cell passes through easily because it's 8 microns, what's this cell going to do? Not pass through capillary beds. And that's exactly what happens in sickle cell anemia. So what's really fascinating about sickle cell anemia is we know the gene mutation occurred in Africa, which is why it's much more common in African Americans. Uh, and we've tracked it to actually the, a, a, a region of Africa at this point. Not only do we know the continent, but now we know uh, a region of Africa where, where the gene mutation most likely occurred. Usually when you have gene mutations that are deleterious like this, they aren't carried in the population. So the fascinating story about sickle cell anemia was, why do you get a gene mutation that leads to early mortality, teenage mortality, which would normally prevent you from carrying the genes to next 
because you're not reproductively active if you're dying at 13, 14, 15 years old. How, how is that being carried in the population? And the fascinating part of that story was that people who, whose gene, whose cells really signal out have two genes for, two genes for that. So if we think about hemoglobin, then we got a gene for normal hemoglobin, we could have a gene for <coughs> sickle cell hemoglobin. So the people who are dying in their teens are dying uh, because they have two genes for the sickle cell. So if you, if you have two genes for sickle cell, you're probably not going to make your 16th birthday without medical intervention. So I just had a friend who took some Gonzaga students to remote Africa for four weeks to provide health care. And she said, you know, you hear this stuff, but until you're there, you'll never, you'll never understand it. She said, when she was in remote, that remote area of Africa, there were almost no 16 to 28-year-old men that were okay. They're dying from AIDS. And so we have young kids without parents, young kids with single moms, and hardly any uh, reproductive age men left in the population. And she said you would, you would have a family go to the clinic one week, and she would give them a bunch of stuff, the next week there would be two less kids. And they died during that week because of different things going on. She said it was just an, an amazing eye-opening because we hear it, but until you're there, I can see what's going on. Well, what's fascinating is one of the kids, why, one of the re common reason why these kids were dying was malaria. The kids were contracting malaria. So what's fascinating about our geopolitical environment is malaria drugs, anti-malaria drugs are reasonably expensive. So to think we could probably export enough anti-malaria drugs to really help is probably not the answer. Mosquito netting for people while they're sleeping is dirt cheap. And why we aren't providing mosquito netting for all these people is just an amazing thing to think about. But that would save, save most of their lives. So, so what happens, what's fascinating is, and the connection between the stories, is that people who have one gene for normal hemoglobin, one gene for sickle cell anemia, are resistant to malaria. Are resistant to malaria. And that's why this deleterious gene stays in the population. Because if you don't carry it, then you're going to die of malaria before you're a teenager. And if you have two genes, you're going to die before you're a teenager. And so it's actually heterozygous people that maintain the gene in the population. So it's an, it's an amazing story where you have two very deadly things that kill you uh, as a child, and it's a genetic combination that survives you, that you survive. But heterozygous don't show the sickle cells. Right, right. correct. Right. They, well, they have, they have uh, the symptoms aren't severe. Right. So they aren't fatal symptoms. And then the fascinating thing is these kids were dying from sickle cell. These kids were dying from malaria. While she was there. These were the kids that would come to the clinic one week and be dead the next week. Yeah. Or another two weeks. So pretty amazing story to sick us out of So then the other one is called hereditary spherocytosis, which is actually where the red blood cells don't become bike and cave. And they actually stay round. And when they stay round, then they're they Compression breaks them easily. So where we can sleep on our side all night and not break a bunch of red blood cells, people with this sleeping on their sides would begin to break a bunch of red blood cells because of the pressure on the red blood cells. Yeah. So remember that what keeps a cell in shape is a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is programmed genetically. That's why we have square cells and cuboid cells. So it's a gene mutation toward the formation of a cytoskeleton. It doesn't create that bifurcated shape at the end. So, so kind of cool process. Do they still have that? Or do they? 
No, the, the nucleus is typically gone, but they just don't rearrange their shape. All right. So the other thing that's fascinating about blood is we have markers on blood. And in World War One, at the start of World War One, and you look at warfare, it's pretty amazing. So, so every war has created some amazing advances in medical care. And then every war has new weapons that are more efficient at killing people. So then we have to have more medical advances to keep people alive in war. So it's an amazing trend when you look at it. So in World War I, the guns were really crude guns. In the Revolutionary War, even more crude guns. But when you created trauma and you couldn't stop the bleeding, people had to death. And we had no way of adding new blood to them. So hypovolemic shock was the common cause of death. So what we did in World War I is, is this guy who's won the Nobel Prize figured out that we couldn't stick blood from one person into another person randomly. How did they figure that out? Because they tried it. <laughs> they would have one pa patient who's just amputated an arm because it got shot. They'd have another soldier who's in good health. They'd lay them on a gurney, lay them on a gurney, stick a needle in the one guy's, put a tube, stick the needle in the other and transfer blood. And then the guy would go ahead and die. So then it was like, what in the world's going on? Why is it, why is this person dying? after we did this, because we thought we could resolve this. So it was during World War I that this scientist began to look at cell identifiers. And he was the one that figured out that we actually have two cell identifiers that are on red blood cells. So one is A, and the other is B. So that you can have a B cell identifier or an A cell identifier. So then what happened was we were able to figure out that we had people that only had A, we had people that only had B, we had people that had both A and B. Then we had people with no cell identifiers. So then the blood types became A, B, AB, and O, because there are no cell identifiers on on the blood cell itself, right? And then further research, and it was actually research done uh, because a lot of primates share a lot of characteristics of blood with us, where they actually found another uh, one, which was RH, which stands for rhesus monkey, which was where it was found first. So that we could have RH. So now we can have somebody with A with not RH, so this would be AB. A positive, A negative. We could have somebody B with RH or without RH. So B, B positive or B negative. Then we have somebody with both A and B who have a third one, which would be the RH. So then we can have AB positive and AB negative. We can have people with O that have the RH factor or lack the RH factor. So O positive or O negative. So we end up with a number of different uh, cell identifiers that allow us to, to type blood and cross type blood. So it's, it's pretty fascinating uh, situations. So these, these are the RBCs themselves, the, the red blood cells. The other constituent in our blood is blood plasma. Now, what you can't have is the same identifier with the same antibody. So antibodies are used to identify cell identifiers, right? So if we think of, if we think of the way the immune system works, and what we learned, uh, which is, was amazing, all from this work is so, for example, we were exposed to a virus like a polio virus. And what we found was that some people would survive polio, although they would have some significant side effects. Other people would die quickly from polio. And what they found was when you're exposed to a virus, 
or a bacteria, there are cells in your body, which are those B lymphocytes, that have to come in contact with the bacteria, and what they produce is an antibody. And the antibody is a Y-like shaped thing. So that when you're exposed to the virus, the virus actually has an identifier on it. And the antibody binds to the identifier. And then once the antibody and the virus are in a complex, that's how your monocytes know to eat. So until the antibody is formed, your monocytes don't know to eat the virus. But once the antibody has been formed, then your monocytes know to eat the virus. So what we learned to do was kill viruses so they couldn't be active and inject those dead viruses into someone. That was a vaccine because you would identify the identifier on the dead virus, you would produce the antibody. So that if you were exposed to the virus, you immediately can destroy it where normally it takes 7 to 14 days for you to undergo that process of discovering the virus, creating the antibody so that you can ingest it. So if you get a flu vaccine, you don't get sick for any of the viruses that were in the flu vaccine. But if the viruses trick you and there's a different virus, you still get sick. And you get sick and you start feeling worse and then it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and you turn the corner. And that's because you now are producing antibodies and you can protect yourself. So the whole thing about uh, vaccines is they protect people. So I'm always amazed when, when I hear people say, I'm not going to give my kids any vaccines because it's like this wicked thing to do. Data is what you should look at instead of emotions. In Sunday's paper, they had the exact amount of decrease in mortality from chicken because of chicken. And the mortality in kids is way low that have been vaccinated. The mortality in adults that were never vaccinated and kids that are unvaccinated is still much higher. Is that actually like shingles? Like, does it take the virus? Yeah, but there's a different vaccine for shingles. Which you can get now at age 55. Because we can't produce them now. So we have to protect the population that's moved most uh, vulnerable to, which is older people. All right, so anyway, so you can't have the identifier and the antibody together. So somebody who has A can have antibody A in their blood, so they have to have antibody B in their plasma. Somebody who has B type blood can't have antibody B in their blood, so they have to have antibody any in the blood. Somebody who has AB blood can't have either. In their blood. And somebody who doesn't have a cell identifier, it doesn't matter, so they have both antibodies. So the guy in World War II figured this out, and he realized that since I can collect plasma from somebody who's A, and I can get this A antibody, and I can collect plasma from somebody who's B and get this B antibody, then I can create a way where I can test for blood. So we end up with a little typing slide, and we put antibody A in this well, we put antibody B in this well, and then later in life, we figured out that the RH has an antibody to it as well, so that we can put the antibody for RH here, which is usually called D for some reason, right? Then what happens is you drop blood in it. If the blood clots, then we know that the blood clotted because antibody A and antigen A were exposed to one another. That's what was happening when they were taking random blood and putting it in someone. This blood was all clotting inside their blood vessels, which was killing them. <laughs> and so it took that process to 
figure all that stuff out. several anthropology websites, but universities, and they have all the blood typing. And when you look at very remote populations that have had very little input uh, from the outside world yet, they're, they're almost all dominated by O type. Blood. And it isn't until you get to areas where there's been a lot of uh, interaction between different populations where you start to get biggest variation in blood type. So when you look at these really isolated populations, they're almost all O. So I'd suggest that O was probably the most common blood type. And the others are all new mutations on the kind of cool story. So, for example, and I just, this is one of the coolest sites uh, at Palmer University where you can do anthropology. You can look up anything, like if you have ancestry, like maybe Welsh or Irish, you can actually go see what the average what the common, common blood type is in that, that population. So it's really kind of cool if you want to look at your family history to do that. So we look at Europe as a grand scheme. We know that, uh, we know at this point, no matter how you believe life started on Earth, that humans started at the equator. So we're running around butt naked and we couldn't go to the poles because we froze to death. So we had to learn to use tools to make things so we could expand. So what's quite fascinating is that African and European are fairly similar. The biggest difference is the amount of A in the population. Uh, it is much higher in Caucasians than it is in African Americans. The other fascinating story about that is those are the most common RH negatives. These are RH positives. So Caucasians are 85% RH positive. African Americans are 95% RH positive. All of Asia is 100% RH positive. So it appears that RH positive, that, that blood, blood probably started all as RH positive O. O positive was probably the most common blood type. And then we got gene mutations, A, E, and a gene mutation for RH. <laughs> yeah. And so it's kind of interesting. So one of the things that led us to understand the Native Americans or more closely related to Asians was 100% RH. And Native Americans, for example, are 80% RH. 16% um, A and only about 1% RH. And you can look at, at Korean and Japanese, and they have the highest AB uh, in, in the population. They have more uniform distributions. So it's pretty fascinating data when you look at it. There's no positive and negative in terms of good or bad. So why are we worried about our age? It really comes down to pregnancy and blood transfusion. So, so what happens is if mom is R H negative, so mom could be A negative, B negative, A B negative, or O negative. It doesn't matter, but she's negative. And the father is positive, and the baby's going to be positive because the, the RH factor is dominant. It's the dominant gene, all right? So it'll be expressed. Well, what happens now is that mom has inside of her blood that she will build antibodies to if she comes in contact with it. Now, what's fascinating is we know that some of blood Babies' stem cells, blood stem cells, actually migrate into mom. And we've actually been able to identify the stem cells from sons in mom as a direct match. So we, we now know that stem cells migrate into mom from babies. But the RH isn't being expressed on those stem cells. Otherwise, mom would build antibodies to it. So normally during the first pregnancy, the only time that, that mom's blood comes directly in contact with baby's blood 
particularly babies, babies' red blood cells that would have the Rh factor on them, is when the placenta is beginning to come apart from the uterus. So what you have at the placenta is you've got the placenta that's part of baby that all contains baby's blood. And then you've got mom's uterine lining that contains mom's blood. And they aren't exchanged. But when the placenta begins to break up, then baby's blood gets mixed with mom's blood during the birthing process. And as soon as mom's blood comes in contact with this red blood cell with our age, then mom's B lymphocytes will begin to produce an antibody. And then mom will produce these antibodies for our age. So what happens is antibodies do travel through the placenta. So what happens is during the next birth, the, the next pregnancy, mom's body will destroy the baby so that the baby will be in miscarriage. So if you look at the 1800s and you look at data, what was pretty fascinating is that mom would have one baby and then miscarry every baby up here. That's because of this RH. Assuming it's the same dad or same RH dad. So now what they do is they they know mom's RH and blood type. They do baby's blood type. And if baby is positive, mom is negative, they give a, uh, gave her a shot called Rogam. I, I always have to do Rogam, Rogaine. One does hair, <laughs> one does <laughs> antibody cited Rogam. So that she can't produce antibodies. It prohibits antibody formation. So that when baby's blood is exposed, she can't produce antibodies. And then she does resistance. So clinically, typically they taste the they do baby's blood because not always do you know that dad was really dad, so, so it's not always certain of that. When my wife used to deliver babies, she was always amazed at how many when she had having babies, it really wasn't sure who the dad was. So, uh, we're out of time. So what we're going to do is I set this up exactly like I want you to know it. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, 